I want all of you to imagine that there's a child's heart projected in front of me and that only I can see. I can see the heart. I can see the heart actually pumping. I can see the heart valves opening. I can see actually a defect in the heart. I can actually hear the heart sounds. If I start interacting with the heart and you don't see it, I'm sure you will start thinking that something is wrong with this man. He's gone mad. You have a potentially mad cardiologist today in front of you. <laughs> I am talking about another dimension in cardiac imaging. Here you can see a image, a virtual reality of a ship that is created by light and water. This is in Amsterdam. This is a virtual reality. Quite often, reality is something very mixed for me. It is a mixture of the virtual and the real. And what I described just now is something that happens to me every day. Only thing is that I do not see or visualize in front of me, but it happens in my brain. I can see the child's heart, I can see the defect, I analyze the defect and plan the surgery. Only difference is my patient trusts me or patient's parents trust me and let me to work together to heal the problem. But visualizing the heart is very important and close to me. How we visualize objects is equally important. Going back to my childhood, I remember growing up in a remote village in India in a moonlit night when the light goes over a dead banana leaf and it moves in the, in the darkness and nothing much to visualize, ghosts really existed in my life. But you know, great ideas are like ghosts. Only if you truly believe in them, it comes into being. Otherwise, it never exists. So often there is a mix between reality and real and the virtual in my life. But seeing reality is a complex process. The, something has to, a, a light has to reflect from an object. Then it has to come to your retina. It has to be strong enough to stimulate the retina to send a signal. Then that signal has to pass to your brain. It has to go to both sides of the brain. And then brain codes it. And then it matches with what it already knows. And then we recognize it. We don't see things which we do not know about. We ignore them. To an extent, sometimes we don't even see things if you don't like it, or we try to see things to which we are tuned to. For example, if you look at this painting, I'm sure a botanist would see there is a chlorophyll molecule trying to get light from the sun, and photosynthesis may be the concept that one person may think. As a cardiologist, I may think that there is blue blood going to the lung, getting oxygenated and coming back pink. An artist may think this is a great picture of a creation or, a, or uh, represents life. So things mean different to us quite often. It depends on how we look at it. It was an Indian sage called uh, Kanada in 500 BC who first described human pulse. And around the same time, there was a man called, uh, it, he was a Persian thinker called Abu Ibn Sina, Latinized as Avicenna, who f uh, first felt the pulse of a child. It was not a child, actually, it's a young adult, and diagnosed a heart condition. He was, uh, the child was brought to this uh, thinker, and uh, he was not very well. He felt the pulse and started describing the surrounding to him. He described the, the roads and the neighborhood. Then he started talking about people in the neighborhood. And the moment he said the name of a girl in the neighborhood, the child's heart started, uh, the pulse started bounding. He diagnosed love sickness and said, this boy has to marry this girl. And I believe he was cute. <laughs> I mean, time has passed a lot since then. And it was in the late 1800s we realized that electricity from the heart can be uh, you know, recorded by EKG. But even after 120 years now, still we see the same EKG, QRS complex. But heart is a three-dimensional structure. Heart generates electricity and spreads around. And uh, very recently I had a student from Grand Valley University who is working with me to generate three-dimensional image of the heart in the electrical way of spreading the heart signals. This is the first 
echocardiogram, an attempt to see heart by sending sound. So ultrasound is sent to the heart. When it reflects or echoes, you try to see the heart in a single dimension. This is called an M-mode echocardiogram. The sound comes and reflects on the aortic wall and then passes through, comes to the other side of the wall. And these two lines represent the aortic wall. And actually, if you measure it, that's the size of the aorta. This is the valve opening, closing, opening, closing. This is how we visualized heart as an M mode. We believed it in, at that point in time, because that was how we used to see heart. Then we started seeing heart like this. You can see the upper and lower chambers of the heart on the right side, upper and lower chambers of the heart on the left side. This is called the mitral valve. This is called the tricuspid valve. This is how, till very recently, we looked at the heart. This is a three-dimensional image of the heart, where you can see actually the tricuspid valve, or a three-leaflet valve, coming together, trying to close itself. And um, so you can see the valve and its apparatus, the supporting system, very clearly by using three-dimensional echocardiography. This is another example of a, a heart problem. This is a hole in the heart. You can see blood flowing through the hole. But this is three-dimensional visualization of the hole in the heart. So it has significantly changed the way I treat patients with a hole in the heart. In fact, I was asked to give a lecture on three-dimensional imaging of this particular type of hole in the heart. I never thought this is important because it was so easy for me to close these holes. I thought, okay, for giving the talk, I will do the imaging. And uh, I was astonished what I saw and what I imagined in my, my brain. It was totally different. Since then, three-dimensional echocardiography is my religion. I preach, though I am an interventional cardiologist, I, because I get the accurate information from three-dimensional imaging. For me, three-dimensional imaging is not just another image of the heart. It is a virtual heart, frozen in time, immortalized. That means I can go back, check this heart, wake it up, it starts pumping. I can slice it, and I can look it from every angle, which a pathologist can't do, because if you slice the heart, you destroy it, whereas this is immortal. So I can learn from, I go back to my surgeon, ask, did you find that? No, no, that was like this. So I come back and see what was wrong. So it teaches me, trains me. So I believe in this imaging, but I think the computing power has come to a different stage now where we can visualize things differently. Here I am showing a virtual image of the aortic valve created by computing. So it's a virtual image taken from echocardiogram. And then we texture it, modify it, give color to look real. Then you can see another heart valve. This is the mitral valve. You can see the blood flowing in. Again, this is a virtual image created from three-dimensional imaging. And now I have put the mitral valve and the aorta together as it is in the heart. And imagine, if you can put all these things together, the whole pumping chamber, the valve, the leak of the valve, the aorta, and you think you can reconstruct this into a virtual reality that you can see the inside of the heart much more clearly. And then we, we have other imaging modalities, like this is a four-dimensional MRI. From this and the echocardiography, we created this model of the heart. And this patient was thought to be inoperable. And we actually looked at this heart together with the surgeon. And we said, no, this can be fixed. And this man is significantly changed since we printed this model and repaired this heart defect. Now what we are doing is trying to get the strength of each imaging modality, like MRI, CT scan, echocardiogram. Bring this together into one platform and color code it according to uh, uh, the origin of the image. So the MRI picture is there, the echo picture is there, the other information that we get from is put into one platform and then we try to create a virtual image of the heart, then we can print it. So you, this was the first printed multimodality imaging, first time ever done, and that was done in Grand Rapids. But what is the problem with printed three-dimensional heart? It is a dead heart because it is not beating. The heart is supposed to pump and uh, eject blood out of it. So the next step for us is to create a virtual integrated three-dimensional heart model which integrates all the images together, and then texture to look like a normal heart, then give the electrical spread of the heart onto it, incorporate pressure and volumes to it, 
and then project it into the patient, and then visualize in three dimensions. Visualizing three dimensions is progressing now. We have a team working with uh, people who make 3D glasses, which may be able to visualize. Or there is another industry which is making holographic three-dimensional projections so that we don't see three-dimensional images in a two-dimensional flat screen. My hope and belief is that in my lifetime, I will be operating on a child who is lying in front of me, but I have the heart projected on top of the chest where I can see the valves and the, the defects in the heart. I can see the tubes and catheters I put into the heart without causing radiation, without harm to the child, and repair the defect. And it is in the near future. Thank you for listening.